There we go. Hey guys, welcome back to the project, um, the online se event series, Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. This is Elise, I'm the organizer of this project, and I'm with my fellow friends and panelists, Andrew and Elena. Um, this video is going to be one where we are discussing the answers that we have prepared for the pre-submitted questions in the Q&A section. So, all right, let's, let's kick this off. For um, the first question, Elena, we have a question from Jessica, and she asks, are you worried about white people patronizing people of color in their attempts to learn to be anti-racist? Is there a line between learning, helping, and patronizing? Yes. Oh, this is such a great question, and one that I'm glad I had a minute to process it, because I think um, definitely this is all too common. Um, there can be lots of um, uh, unintentional patronizing or condescension uh, when people are trying to figure out their way, right? And I think part of it too is just recognizing, like taking a step back and recognizing that um, our country and the U.S. here is is in a place of reckoning, of um, really trying to own <laughs> all of the. Um, you know, police brutality, systemic racism that uh, people are becoming more aware of and um, really learning to sit with that for a moment um, and lament that before like repenting and taking action. I think so much of what we've been taught in this country about race relations is that, oh, we should just push towards uh, racial reconciliation and that hasn't gotten us anywhere. We can't just like hug this out. Um, you know, like we are in a place of reckoning of really just trying to understand and dig deep what it means um, that black and brown people, indigenous people in this country um, have been treated as second class citizens. And unless we're willing to really go through that and not just say, hey, we need to get over it, uh, then we're going to get to a place where, you know, it, it just becomes a very condescending process. Um, and so as people are learning, I've, um, you know, really had to recognize um, in myself and others that there needs to be a lot of deep listening and humility when it comes to these conversations. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, like, white supremacy rears its ugly head and people are just going to want to fix it and to tell you what, you know, this is the right messaging or, uh, you know, like that's not respectable. And that's where a lot of the tension is right now as people are really uh, struggling with how to sit with that. And you can't sit with it if you're not willing to be, um, you know, humble. And so for Jessica and others who are, you know, wondering how to show up, that it's really important um, that we listen to people of color and their lived experiences. And um, this is a time, especially for white people, to not be the leader, to not be the teacher, the fixer, but really to be a student and to serve and in many ways to submit. Uh, and that is uncomfortable. White supremacy, you know, does not teach that. But if we're going to be anti-racist, uh, for all of us, even, you know, people of color who've internalized whiteness, uh, we've got to take that position of learning and listening to one another and being humble. Or else um, we get what happens where people really want to uphold their intentions and um, be defensive about, you know, that and not want to own the impact of their actions. And really what matters is, you know, that the outcomes of all this um, striving that I think people are, are trying to do, they mean well, but if the impact is still that, you know, people of color are being dismissed and not listened to and being talked over, then those intentions don't matter. Um, once again, we're holding up this racial reconciliation framework, um, whereas um, we wanna get to liberation, to collective uh, justice, 
then it really means decentering <laughs> whiteness and um, decentering our intentions and coming to the space with um, humility, with deep listening, and also with accountability, knowing that we're all going to mess up. Like we're all learning. Uh, it's going to be awkward. <laughs> Uh, but if you can maintain that posture of just, um, again, acknowledging that um, we're all human, it's going to be messy, uh, then I think it becomes more a fruitful discussion than one that historically just continues to just, you know, really be patronizing um, because it will want to center whiteness. And that's, that's unfortunately not... That's not, not the default <laughs> that we're trying to lift up now. Um, and because we're seeing that it hasn't worked, <laughs> it hasn't worked for anyone. Um, and so, yeah, I just, it takes practice, I'll have to say. Like, it takes practice for me to hear these kinds of questions myself and just be like, okay, that person means well and they, they want to learn. How do I take that and not be, uh, you know, <laughs> defensive? about people wanting to learn um, as long as it really is, yeah, earnest. Um, all that to say, just keep at it, but listen and be humble and own, own your stuff and <laughs> learn to sit with the discomfort. So I think it's the only way we'll all break free together. <laughs> mm, thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just from the heart and also in a place where it's accessible, you know, people, I feel like I feel like that's so beautiful that you're willing to share that it's a progress for you too to sit with the questions to come and be met with questions and and then for people to be humble and to learn um, you know it goes both ways so um, thank you for sharing that vulnerably um, so Andrew we have a we have a question for you too and it's from Miranda Miranda asks. How do I increase diversity in my friend group without being insensitive? Every time I meet a person of color, I worry that I'll come across as wanting token friends. I want to make some new and genuine friends, but navigating my white privilege and their unique racial experiences is extremely difficult for me. Yeah, so this was a question that I found very interesting because um, I think it just shows a level of self-awareness that to me gives me some level of appreciation that uh, the person asking it is, is wrestling with these questions. Um, I, I think that that level of self-awareness to check your biases, to um, be aware of the racial dynamics of friendships, probably in some ways ameliorates the negative outcomes um, just by you being aware of it and acting on that kind of awareness, right? Um, Unfortunately, I've seen, particularly in Christian circles, uh, exactly kind of what Elena, you were saying, that kind of attitude of like, when there is a, a sermon on racial reconciliation, it's just kind of at the level of, just go find a black friend and things will be better. Um, and that's not at all, like that, that's, that's not a bad step, but um, one, treating people as like a project for you to fix your racism um, is perpetuating, I would say. Um, kind of a racist, a racist narrative. Uh, and also particularly, I think the idea of like putting um, the onus on like a person of color, um, somebody who is, who's experienced the effects of white supremacy as kind of the person to help you figure out your stuff. Um, it, it, it reinforces those kind of power dynamics, right? Um, so I think just being aware, you know, that as you enter into friendships with people of color, that there are those racial dynamics for you as a white person. Um, and owning those, like what Elena said, is, is super, super important. Um, just as kind of being aware of your white privilege in the relationship is difficult for you, how much more difficult is it, a, is it for us as people of color to live with the privilege in the room, right? As the people who are not experiencing it. Um, I know for myself as a man, like it, it goes the opposite direction for me with my male privilege, right? And friendships with women. Um, so being intentional uh, is, is good and a good starting point. Um, but I think it's what Elena said, kind of apply that on a microcosm of your friendship and things will be really good. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that um, the idea of like token friendships, it, it depends where you are, right? If like, I know growing up here in the Midwest in the 90s in Ohio, 
um, having a diverse friend group kind of might have looked like a token friend group as you would just be able to find like one person of each race and that's the best you could do for your area. Um, but uh, yeah, as you know, depending on where you are, uh, those options might be different, different for you. Um, but I would say ultimately the idea of wanting a diverse friend group uh, probably could be something that's a little bit fetishizing, but if, if it's gone about in a certain way, but I think at the same time, the idea of wanting a diverse friend group and I, of wanting people of different experiences in your life is actually a really good and holy thing. Um, as I've mentioned before, like in the intro video for um, people who've seen it, uh, if every human is uniquely created in the image of God, and particularly every ethnicity, right? Like whether you are um, black or brown or white, if you are, if we are all equally created in the image of God, that means there are certain parts of God and who he is that is expressed in, in those cultures. Um, so when you meet somebody of another culture, you are kind of seeing a different image of who God is, right? You're seeing a different image of God who is in that person in their culture. Um, and I think for any Christian, that should be a really exciting and really beautiful thing to be able to have the chance to love somebody else and to love God more through that experience. Um, and ultimately in the kingdom of heaven, right? It is going to be multi-ethnic. So if you want to start living the kingdom now in your life, have multi-ethnic friends, right? Like people are not going to be only of your ethnicity in heaven. Um, so start preparing for the kingdom now, right? <laughs> like live that here. Uh, and a good way to do that is to intentionally create friendships with people of different races. Because to be honest, like, you know, friendships often happen because of similar interests, because of similar kinship. Um, and therefore, you probably are gonna have a natural tendency to become friends with people who belong to your same race. Um, and that's okay because, you know, similarities are there and that's, that's okay on, by itself. But like I said, in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of history, in the grand scheme of your life and our social, cultural context, um, as a Christian, I think that you should want uh, that diversity in your life. It's a good and holy thing. Um, and you should want to be able to fight against injustices of racism. Um, not only in the abstract or political sense, but also very much in the interpersonal sense. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm, I love having you guys as friends. You guys are so good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Oh my gosh. Yes, this is holy, holy and hard work. And really excited about the people asking these questions and um, trying to grow in self-awareness. Uh, Elise, there is also a question from Bob who asked, um, actually, what questions should Bob be asking uh, to better understand and empathize with someone who has uh, perhaps a far different life experience than they do? Thank you, Elena, and thanks, Bob. Um, since I don't know Bob's background, I'm just gonna approach this without any idea <laughs> of where Bob is coming from, except that, you know, just on just, just the question itself. And I think it's a great question. Um, I personally usually encounter this kind of question from people who are scared out of their pants about saying the wrong thing, as well as those who are new to the entire conversation and don't really know how to navigate it. The way I would like to reply is to encourage you to reflect on your personal and neighborly friendships and relationships. I think it's really natural and open um, and, and normal to be receptive to your friends and your neighbor's experiences as you share with one another. To share, to ask questions, to be part of each other's lives. And when you're in a conversation with someone new or someone who looks different than you, um, for whatever reason, someone that you assume would have different life experiences than you, I would only encourage you to focus on developing that personal relationship. And that means, similar to how Elena and Andrew were saying, you can listen, you can ask questions, not only to gain, but to seek to give more than you've received. And um, as far as the empathy piece of, of your question for Bob, um, I think empathy is more natural in a personal relationship. It doesn't feel forced. You know, you just you care about someone you know. Um, so I would also then encourage you to not be afraid to ask questions that are commensurate to the level of trust that is part of the relationship. And be willing to share about your own experiences that are relevant too. 
Um, and as you get to know one another in the normal way that friends and neighbors do, you'll come to understand their experiences bit by bit. Um, and I feel like um, that might be that might be the best place that is a win-win solution, you know, for for having a new friend in your life as well as um, enriching each other's lives and helping each other grow in a way that is safe, that is personal, that's private, and that is um, trusted. You know, you trust your own process in developing relationships, and so does that person. So engaging in that together, you don't have to worry about understanding the entire world's experiences and empathizing with all six billion people all at once right now. You can just start where you are. So I, I think that's I think that's what I would offer. Move on. Well, um, thank you so much for engaging in this Q and A and um, giving the gift to you guys of your own personal reflections for some people's questions um, that were pre-submitted for our panel talk. And um, at this point, I. Um, I just want to say I hope this was encouraging for all those who are watching. I hope it was encouraging for you guys as well as we were talking about it and, um, and, and got to respond to some questions in this space. And um, I hope it inspires some people to have conversations with the important people of, of their lives, whether you guys have questions or you want to share something you experienced or just to make this topic of racial experience just a little less scary to approach and more manageable. And with that, we'll close this video. God bless. Bye.